The following story takes place between the years 1066 and 1154. In today's video, we're going to cover the rule of the Norman dynasty. It's a period of 88 years that started off relatively peaceful, but then became increasingly turbulent with each new king who reached the throne, until by the end it was just totally bonkers. Greed, lust and envy fueled alliances and betrayals between relatives, leading to murder and even full-on wars, which were sometimes decided by random twists of fate. If you need some background, you can check out the previous episodes of this series. Otherwise, hold on to your britches and join us for this crazy ride. The coronation of William the Conqueror as King of England in 1066 was the beginning of the Norman dynasty. However, Monsieur Will didn't have an easy time of it when it came to ruling England. Consider that there were about 20,000 Normans faced with a population of 2 million Englishmen who regarded them as upstart invaders. Nobody wants you here! Plus, the children of Harold Godwinson, whom William had defeated and killed at Hastings, fled to Ireland, and from there they worked to instigate rebellion against the new king. Therefore, William began by befriending several important English earls, like Edwin of Mercia, Morcar of Northumbria, and Waltheof of Northampton, allowing them to keep their lands and titles as long as they supported him. He even gave some land in the far north to Edgar Aetheling, the last rightful heir of the House of Wessex, so he could retire quietly and not cause any trouble. However, in 1068, Edwin and Morcar revolted against William, who didn't take it well and reacted swiftly by going after them and defeating both. So as to prevent any such uprisings in the future, the Normans ordered the construction of multiple fortresses all over England. The Great Fortress of Rohan. At first they were simple stockades, made out of wood and dirt, or Mott and Bailey castles, but these were gradually replaced by solid stone structures. One famous example is Warwick Castle, which was later followed by others in York, Nottingham, Lincoln, Huntington and Cambridge. However, the most famous of these fortresses was the White Tower, later renamed the Tower of London. Back then it looked nothing like it does nowadays, but it didn't take too long before they started using it to lock up people. I can get you out of here. I help build these cells. William also created a ring of fortifications surrounding London, with Windsor Castle in Berkshire being one of the most important. It started out as a wooden Mott and Bailey fort, but like other similar locations, it was soon replaced by a proper castle. Another important one was Arundel Castle in Sussex, where we can easily see the mound atop which the fortress was constructed. In addition, Oxford Castle was erected on a small promontory, on which a stone tower called St George's Tower had been built. Other notable examples are the amazing Norwich Castle, you should go and see it if you can, Durham Castle and Newcastle uh, Castle, created to protect England's northern border. In addition, the Normans slowly began to make headway into Wales, and there we can find Chepstow Castle and Pembroke Castle. In any case, Westminster Palace, built by Edward the Confessor as we saw in the previous episode, eventually became the habitual residence of the English monarchy during the Middle Ages. William expropriated a lot of land all over the country, and in one such plot in Hampshire, he created the New Forest as a preserve for his favourite pastime, killing small animals. Little could he imagine that the forest would later witness the death of his own son. My son? And since we're talking about how William managed the territory, we must mention that he established a feudal system throughout England. All the lands belonged to him personally, but he ceded their control to lords, who were subject to certain duties and obligations towards the crown. For example, if there was a war and any of these lords or their knights didn't come to support the king, he could freely take their land and give it to other, more loyal vassals. These kinds of political decisions were communicated by the king at the Curia Regis, Serfs such as peasants and artisans became bound to the lords, ruling their region in exchange for protection, while tradesmen, and also Jews, remained under the king's direct jurisdiction. At the same time, Christians were prohibited from lending money for profit, whereas Jewish people weren't, so some of them took advantage of this legal loophole to become very rich through banking and similar businesses. Hello, Jews! In 1069, Edgar Etheling rebelled. Of course, he wasn't alone. He had gained the support of Waltheof, Earl of Northampton, and also the Danish king Sven II, who had arrived in England with a powerful fleet. 
Together they managed to take York, and Edgar was proclaimed king by his followers. When William heard about this, he was furious and decided to make an example of the upstarts. First, he paid off the Danes so that they would go back the way they came, and once they'd left, he pursued Edgar all the way up to Scotland, where he took refuge with his brother-in-law, King Malcolm III. William then began a bloody campaign known as the Harrying of the North, which involved numerous executions, as well as the burning and raising of many villages and fields in the area. It was extremely violent, but it was also successful, and by 1070, William had done away with all opposition. Well, almost all. There remained a small focus of resistance led by Hereward the Outlaw, who operated from the Isle of Ely in the marshes of Cambridgeshire. Hereward, with the support of King Swen II of Denmark and Earl Morcar, conducted multiple raids and generally pestered William until he eventually got fed up and did away with him. Once he had ensured peace and stability throughout the kingdom, William placed a trusted friend, the priest Lanfranc, as Archbishop of Canterbury, the foremost religious figure in England. He also built various temples, including the Battle Abbey, a monastery constructed near the site of the Battle of Hastings, probably to commemorate his great victory. Talking about this battle, we must mention the Bayer Tapestry, a 70 metre long embroidered cloth depicting the entire history of the Norman conquest of England. You can still see it today in, of all places, Bayer. As you can imagine, the Norman invasion also changed things in the cultural sphere. Since most of the old English nobility and clergy were replaced by Normans, their particular dialect of ancient French became the language of power in this New England. Ancient English fused with ancient French and became consolidated as medieval English, along with an admixture of Anglo-Saxon, Britain, Latin and Danish. Speak English English. Around 1073, William considered that he had finally consolidated his hold over England and gradually turned his attention back to his homeland of Normandy particularly the capital city of Rouen, where he spent most of the rest of his reign. So although he ruled both territories, in practice they operated as two completely different states. On that side of the English Channel, William had a few run-ins with Falk IV, Count of Anjou, a member of the Angevin dynasty, which was a very important family in French nobility. The main bone of contention was the rich county of Maine. With this, we arrive at the year 1075, where the event known as the Revolt of the Earls took place. It happened while William was away from England, and various earls joined forces against him. The key conspirators were the Briton, Ralph de Gale, Earl of East Anglia, and the Norman, Roger de Bretille, Earl of Hereford. The reason behind this uprising is not entirely clear, but everything seems to indicate that it was a classic case of powerful men being greedy and wanting even more power. The rebellion ended with William returning to England and smacking them around, just like you should smack the subscribe and like buttons. William probably had plenty of experience smacking about rebellious individuals since he had several children with his wife Matilde. The firstborn son was Robert Curthose, followed by Richard, who died young while out hunting, William Rufus, and lastly Henry. He also had six daughters, but unfortunately history has left us hardly any records about them. Big surprise. What the records do say is that the brothers didn't get on very well. As an example, in 1077, William Rufus and Henry emptied a urinal on their elder brother Robert, and this predictably ended in a big fight. Not long afterwards, Robert rebelled against his father. It's not entirely clear why, maybe something to do with his brother's toilet humour, or the inheritance, who knows. Regardless, the key point is that Robert was supported by various Norman nobles, and together they sieged the castle of Remillard in southern Normandy. William soon expelled them from his domains, but Philip I of France gave these rebels the fortress of Gelbroy to use them as a proxy force against William. The situation ended in a battle between father and son, in which William was defeated and peace finally returned when he promised Robert that he would inherit the Duchy of Normandy upon his death, and also probably that no one else would empty we over his head. Thanks to this, the final decade of William's life was slightly more relaxed. The most notable aspect of this period is that in 1083, Robert rebelled once again, with the help of Philip I of France, once again. What a pain in the arse. However, this made it clear to William that Normandy needed to find allies against the French monarchy, so he married his daughter, Constance, to Alan IV, Duke of Brittany. In 1085, William ordered the creation of the Doomsday Book, an exhaustive survey of all his English domains. 
His envoys went around, county by county, recording every last bit of property of each landowner and thus calculating the taxes they should pay. A little bit later, in 1087, William travelled to the French region of Vexin, located between Rouen and Paris, to fight his son Robert once again. Well, it's Groundhog Day. Alas, William would never complete the journey. The actual events are not entirely clear. It appears that he either fell ill or fell from his horse, but either way, the result was that William the Conqueror died soon afterwards before he could complete the Siege of Mantes. His corpse was moved to the Abbey of Saint Etienne, or Men's Abbey in Cannes, which he himself had ordered to be built. The chronicles say that the funeral was spoiled by a peasant who'd managed to get in somehow and started to complain that they were all a bunch of bastards because they had expropriated the land illegally from his family in order to build the church. As it turns out, the guy was telling the truth, so they had to pay him off to keep him quiet. Some things never change. Take your money and get out, because I'm tired of listening to you. Upon William's death, just as promised, Robert inherited the Duchy of Normandy. However, England was not included in the package, and instead was handed over to the third son, who became William II, although he was generally known as William Rufus, meaning William the Red. No, of course he wasn't a communist. The name came either because he was red-haired when he was a young boy, or because of his ruddy complexion, or perhaps because he had different coloured eyes, nobody really knows. What we do know is that he was considered extravagant, which was code for gay, because he had no interest in marriage or fathering any children. If you've seen our previous episode, you'll recall another childless king of England, Edward the Confessor, and the amount of trouble that led to, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. When William the Conqueror died, his sons didn't manage to agree upon the inheritance, and so they began to fight amongst themselves in what is known as the Rebellion of 1088. Robert sought to unite England and Normandy under his rule, and for that he planned to invade England. However, he didn't quite have the means for it. Wars are rather expensive. And so he requested support, mainly in the form of money, from his brother Henry, who agreed to finance the invasion in exchange for the Norman county of Contentin. But after having secured the means, Robert was unable to carry out his invasion, because William Rufus outsmarted him by getting a powerful nobleman from Rouen called Conan Pilatus to rebel against Robert and siege the Norman capital. Robert enlisted the help of his brother Henry, and together they managed to contain the fighting and eventually capture Conan, with Henry ending up so fed up with this Conan that he threw him off the top of a castle tower. By 1091, both King William Rufus and Duke Robert had exhausted their troops and treasure, so they decided to call it a draw and stop the fighting. This, however, did not work out well for Henry, as his brothers then took away his county of Contentin and besieged him at Mont Saint Michel. He was forced to surrender and flee, and for a while ruled the town of Donfranc from atop a little castle. Lovely. Then a new threat rose up in the north. No, not ice giants. It was Malcolm III of Scotland who made an incursion into England. William Rufus stopped him and then, in order to prevent future trouble, built Carlisle Castle in Cumbria. But that wasn't very effective I'll because be Malcolm returned with an even greater force. The Norman noble Robert de Mowbray led the English troops at the Battle of Annick in 1093 and succeeded in killing both Malcolm and his son. It seems that this gave William confidence, so he decided to attack Wales and managed to conquer several territories in the south, including the great kingdom of Durhabarth. In 1093, he appointed a new archbishop, Anselm of Canterbury, widely considered the greatest theologian of his generation. But then Anselm revealed himself as a strong supporter of Gregorian reform, which advocated the Pope's spiritual superiority over all Christian kingdoms. William wasn't on board with this, and that caused a few disagreements between them, to the point that Anselm ended up exiled at the court of Pope Urban II. The Pope was a diplomatic guy and eventually reached a deal with William Rufus, agreeing to support the independence of Anglo-Norman clergy with all its particularities in exchange for William recognising him as Pope. This period left us several religious constructions such as the cathedrals of Durham, Winchester and the most beautiful of all, Norwich Cathedral. Also, 1096 saw the founding of Oxford University. Well, in all fairness, the exact date isn't really known, but what is sure is that classes had already started in that year. 
And of course, we couldn't mention Pope Urban II without talking about the First Crusade, especially because Robert Curthose, remember him, decided to join this fun summer camp and left none other than William Rufus as a regent of the Duchy of Normandy in his absence. For the next four years, while in control of Normandy, William tried to conquer both the county of Maine and the region of Vexen, but with no success. He's a failure! Then, in August of 1100, William Rufus went hunting in the New Forest and appeared dead with an arrow sticking out of his side. While no one really knows what happens, the chronicles say that one of the noblemen who accompanied him, Walter Tyrrell, shot him by mistake. However, some believe that it was no accident and instead had been orchestrated by his younger brother Henry in order to take the throne. Ooh, it's very Game of Thrones this, isn't it? You murdered your own brother. was indeed a plot, the truth is that it worked perfectly because Henry Beauclerk was then crowned as Henry I, new King of England and Duke of Normandy. But of course, nothing in this family ever went smoothly, so no sooner did Henry place his bum on the throne than his brother Robert returned from crusading in the Holy Lands and sought to reclaim his Duchy of Normandy. Henry had zero intention of letting it go and a civil war ensued. Over the following six years, Henry and Robert fought non-stop until the Battle of Tinchbray in 1106, where Robert was ultimately defeated and then jailed, first in Wiltshire and then in Cardiff, where he remained until his death. With regard to his rule, Henry I gained the support of earls and lords with the Charter of Liberties, which shifted some of the king's power to these nobles. Not a lot, of course, being king was still a great gig, but this did set a precedent for the famous Magna Carta of 1215. In order to gain legitimacy, Henry I married Matilda of Scotland, also known as Good Queen Maud, daughter of King Malcolm III of Scotland and also niece of Edgar Etheling and therefore great-granddaughter of the old King Edmund Ironside of the House of Wessex. This union produced two children, Matilda, who would later marry the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V and thus be known as Empress Matilda, and William Adeline. In addition, Old Henry was a bit of a horny dog and had plenty of illegitimate children, or bastards as they were referred to in those times, for political correctness, with a host of mistresses and sex workers. I like a sex machine. When he wasn't in the sack, the king met with his inner circle of nobles, known as the Domus, which in turn was divided into three positions. The Chancellor managed royal documents, the Chamberlain was in charge of finance, and the Master Marshal organised travel, lodging and domestic service for his majesty. The king also held regular formal audiences with the nobility at the Curia Regis. Since Henry I maintained an itinerant royal court, travelling from one place to another, he built multiple palaces and castles throughout the land. One such famous place was at Woodstock in Oxfordshire, where the king kept a menagerie of exotic animals, including lions, leopards and even an Indominus Rex. Oh wait. That, sorry, that's a typo. And even a bear. <laughs> that's a good one. Henry I ruled for 35 years and did it quite well. He skillfully manipulated multiple English and Norman nobles to achieve his political goals, established an effective network of spies who kept him informed about any conspiracies against him, and swiftly eliminated anyone who threatened his power. These measures allowed him to have a relatively smooth reign, and so he had time to build lots of stuff. Since he was a fanboy of the Clunaic order, he extended the Romanesque style throughout England, as in the case of Reading Abbey in Berkshire, completed in 1121, and also Exeter and Peterborough cathedrals. His biggest quarrel was with the King of France, Louis VI, and his allies, Falk V, Count of Anjou, and Baldwin VII, Count of Flanders. It all came about because Henry wanted his son, William Adelin, to be his heir in Normandy, but the French king refused to recognise him, preferring to see the crown on the head of William Clito, son of Robert Curthose, and so they had to settle it in the medieval way, with a good old war. This led to a low period for Henry. By 1116, French, Angevin and Flemish troops were raiding the Norman countryside. Two years later, his wife Matilda died, and then, just to top things off, one of his own illegitimate daughters, Julianne de Fontevrault, tried to assassinate him with a crossbow. Well, to be fair, they had had a major fallout which involved Julianne's daughters being blinded and disfigured, but we're not going down that particular horrible rabbit hole because the video would have to be three hours long. Well, who's got time for that? 
Henry's fortune gradually began to improve when Falk V travelled to the Holy Land and left the county of Maine in his charge, in exchange for the betrothal of Henry's heir, William Adeline, to his daughter. In 1119, Henry tried to take the reign of Vexen, and there he had to fight the French King Louis at the Battle of Prémoul. Henry was victorious, and so in 1120, the two kings signed a peace treaty and became besties. Now. So things were going great, everything was resolved, and William Adeline was set to inherit Henry's crown. But then fate intervened. That same year, William travelled to England on a boat, but everyone on board, including the crew, got wasted and they ended up hitting a reef and sinking. William Adeline drowned, along with another 300 poor souls, in what has come to be known as the White Ship Disaster, which threw the succession into mayhem. Henry quickly married Adeliza of Louvain at Windsor Castle, hoping to conceive a male heir, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Moreover, William Adeline's death put an end to the deal with Falk V, who then demanded the return of everything he had conceded, including the County of Maine, which Henry refused to do, and so they started fighting again. Fight! Regardless, that didn't solve the problem of who would become Henry's heir. In the event, the king chose his nephew, Stephen of Blois, which seemed to settle the matter. However, by now you're probably expecting a but, and you'd be right. In 1125, something unexpected happened. Holy Roman Emperor Henry V died, leaving Henry's daughter, Empress Matilda, a widow, and thus giving him an opportunity to appoint a direct descendant as heir. This may sound perfectly normal to us nowadays, but back then it was very unusual to choose a woman. Nevertheless, English nobility proved to be very open-minded about it, and Henry got most of them on board with the plan. Very woke, guys. Thank you for being so cooperative. In addition to keeping the crown in the family, Matilda also gave Henry a way of re-establishing his alliance with Falk of Anjou. Recall that they had agreed to marry Henry's son to Falk's daughter. In 1127, Matilda married Falk's son, Geoffrey V, or Geoffrey the Fair, and the couple had a child, also called Henry, who would later become the first king of the Plantagenet dynasty, whose name is derived from the broom blossom or Plante Jeanette, which Geoffrey usually wore in his hat. Stylish. The Plantagenets would rule England for more than three centuries, as we will see in future videos, but before we get to that, we have to deal with a very dark and chaotic period. It all began in 1135 with Henry's death, reportedly from eating too many lampreys, which is a sort of weird river eel. And while Matilda and Geoffrey were at Anjou organising the funeral, Henry's initial heir, his nephew, Stephen of Blois, rushed over to England from Bologna and got himself crowned as king. Upon hearing the news, Matilda hit the roof and swore to take the throne, kicking off a 20-year-long period of civil war known as the English Anarchy. Anarchy in the UK! Hark ye all, and bid farewell to the law and order in the lands of England and Normandy. <sighs> it was good while it lasted. <laughs> Stephen of Blois was the new King of England, but it came at a high cost. Not only did he have to fight his cousin, Empress Matilda, over the crown, but he also faced rebellions all over the country, headed by English earls, Welsh leaders and Scottish invaders. Since this was a very chaotic and confusing period, sort of like a crossover between The Last Duel and Fight Club, remixed with Battle Royale and directed by Tarantino, we are only going to cover the main points. Yeah, well now, well, keep it short. To begin with, we have to mention an important figure, Robert of Gloucester, a bastard son of Henry I who controlled that county, as well as some lands in Normandy, and who sided with his half-sister Matilda against their cousin Stephen. Matilda and Geoffrey V had taken over Normandy, which had initially supported Stephen, and then in 1139 got themselves a fleet with which to invade England. This was the beginning of the Anglo-Norman Civil War, which quickly became a war of attrition, since the main tactic was to siege castles that were pretty well defended, and therefore conquering each one of them could take several months. At that time, siege engines were scarce and still rather rudimentary, while open field battles were too risky. A quick note on architecture before we get into the thick of the fighting. The book in the series, The Pillars of the Earth, set during this conflict, depict the construction of a cathedral representing the transition between the Romanesque and Gothic styles. Aren't we good to you? We just, we give you a whole rounded picture of things. Anything more we can do for you? 
In 1141, after countless skirmishes all over England, King Stephen was captured by Robert of Gloucester at the Battle of Lincoln. Matilda was overjoyed, as she expected this would be checkmate, and went over to London with the intention of being crowned once and for all. But after getting there, things turned sour, supposedly because she imposed new taxes, and also because of her haughty attitude towards the nobility. And this ended with the city rioting in favour of Stephen, so Matilda had to flee out the back door. Embarrassing. Then, in another conflict which took place in Winchester, Robert of Gloucester was captured by Stephen's supporters, who then proceeded to exchange him for the English king. The following year, the king managed to trap Matilda at the Siege of Oxford Castle, but she was able to escape during the night with an N, aided by her knights with a K. I saw what you did there. So, after lots and lots of fighting, the war was back to square one, and the situation entered a stalemate. As the former chaos devolved into outright devastation, the population started to get completely fed up with all this pointless squabbling. And to make things just a little bit messier, on one side, several English earls rose up in arms against King Stephen, while on the other, many Angevin nobles joined the Second Crusade and left for Jerusalem, weakening Matilda. In addition, her half-brother and main ally, Robert of Gloucester, died from a fever in 1147. Now, as we delve into the final stages, we have another key figure, Matilda's son, Henry Fitzempress, or Henry Kirkmantle. This lad became very important, particularly after 1151, when his father Geoffrey died and he became Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou. The following year, he married a great woman named Eleanor. No, sadly, not Eleanor Morton. She hadn't been born yet. This was Eleanor of Aquitaine. Thanks to this union, Henry added the Duchy of Aquitaine to his already substantial lands in northern France and gained control over a huge territory, perhaps too huge to rule feasibly in the times before WhatsApp groups, as we will see later. It's a little too much to handle. And now, let's try to wrap up this war. In 1153, Henry travelled to England to keep alive the claim for the throne that his parents had started. But after several more sieges, both sides decided they didn't really have the resources to continue fighting, and so they signed the Treaty of Wallingford, which established that Henry would inherit the crown when Stephen passed. Not that there were many other options, because the king's son Eustace had just died. This treaty finally put an end to the disastrous period of anarchy. And it's about damn time if you ask me. The following year, in 1154, King Stephen died, and Henry succeeded him to the English throne as Henry II. He would go down in history as the first Angevin king of England, since his father belonged to the House of Anjou, but this newly formed dynasty, which controlled a vast territory comprising most of England and France, is better known as the Plantagenet dynasty. Among its members are some very famous names in English history, like Richard the Lionheart and Edward Longshanks, whom we will meet in the next video. And the rest is history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave us a big like. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.